are remembering this year and today we're looking at a uh, text from Psalm 119 as we think about the Word of God and remembering Scripture, memorizing Scripture, hiding it in our hearts. And as we begin thinking about that, I want to invite all of our young people to come to the front. All of our young people who are willing, uh, I, I did twist some elbows a few minutes ago, come to the front. You can stand up right here, face me. You can stand up right here. Come on. Oh man, look at all these children. That's great. All right, we're going to sing the song, Oh Be Careful. Do you all know that song? We're going to do motions, Oh Be Careful, Little Eyes. Okay, you just watch. You'll pick it up real fast, okay? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a Father up above, and He's looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a Father up above, and He's looking down in love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. There's a Father up above, and He's looking down in love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. There's a Father up above, and He's looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. There's a Father up above, and He's looking down in love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Watch your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. Watch your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. There's a Father up above, and He's looking down in love. Watch your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. Very good. Thank you all so much. As we look at Psalm 119, this is an alphabet poem. Each stanza of the psalm is representing the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And verses 9 through 16 are the letter Beit, which is like our letter B. And as the psalmist opens verses 19 through 16, he asks a question. How can a young person, how can a young man keep his way pure? And he goes through these verses and he talks about all of the different ways that the young person can use the Word of God with his body and therefore keep a pure way. And that, that made me think of that song. Oh, be careful little eyes. Oh, be careful. But the difference between the song... And the psalm is, the song is talking about what not to do. But the psalm is talking about good things we can do to keep a pure path. And so we're going to look at five different parts of the human body that we can use with the Word of God to walk a pure path. And appropriately, the first one is our feet. But we're going to read the entire stanza verses 9 through 16, before we dive in to that discussion. The psalmist says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. 
I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I want to notice, first of all, the psalmist in answering the question, how can a young person keep his way pure? Now, the psalmist is asking this question perhaps from his own personal perspective, but in reality, we're thinking about all young people. We're thinking about young men and young women, and ultimately about all people. But it's a great place to start if we're young. Now, as he asks this question, I find it interesting. It's in the context of an alphabet poem. Can you turn me down a little bit? Thank you. Oh, that's... <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in the context of an alphabet poem, I think that's really interesting. I don't know if the Jews taught their children the alphabet with this poem, but I can imagine that being the case. They would say Aleph, and then they would quote the first eight verses, Bait, and quote the next eight verses, and go through the alphabet that way. And so I think about the Word of God being as essential to everyday life as the alphabet when I read this poem. Even though we don't think about the alphabet consciously, we use it all the time. In the words that we say, in the thoughts that we think that are built upon words, the alphabet is there as the foundation. The psalmist wants the Word of God to be as fundamental and foundational in his life as the alphabet. And then also there is this emphasis. When do children, when do people learn the alphabet? When we're young. That's when it's easiest for us to pick up these things. And so this is how basic it is. How important it is that we start when we're young in learning the Word of God. And he says, how can the young man keep his path pure? That's the way the NIV puts it. In the Hebrew mind, one's path, one's walk, is one's way of life. If you're walking somewhere... You have to make choices. You have to choose which direction you're going to go. You set a course. And life is very much like that. It is made up of choices, of conscious choices and sometimes subconscious choices in which direction we're going to go. And so the psalmist says, how can the young person keep his way pure? How can he set the right course? And he says, by guarding it according to your word. Now that means this is proactive. It's not simply responding, but it is being prepared by guarding it according to your word, by allowing the word of God to guide you in the choices that you make. You know, it's never too late to start following God's path, but it is easiest when we're young. That's why God instructs parents to train up their children in the way the King James says, the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's why the church is so supportive of that effort in having Bible class and vacation Bible school and youth rallies. We understand that it is the responsibility of parents to train their children, but the church is aiding and supporting that effort. But you know, it's not the case that if a person does not learn the way of the Lord when they're young, that all is lost. In fact, this whole idea of walk lends itself to the idea of repentance that appears so frequently in our New Testament. In Acts chapter 3, Peter has healed a lame man in Solomon's portico. And he is now speaking to the Jews and he says, I'm declaring to you the good news in the name of the one that healed this man. You can see verse 17, he begins to say, now we know that you acted ignorantly when you put Jesus to death. When you took the Lord's Christ, the Lord's anointed one, the promised Messiah, when you put him to death, we know you didn't understand what you were doing. And so he says in verse 19, repent therefore and turn back. That word repent means change direction. Go a different way. The psalmist says, how do I keep my way? How do I keep my path pure? I guard it according to your word. If I haven't done that, I have an opportunity to turn around and go a different way that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. I think this is one of the, the most beautiful things in the Gospel. Have you ever gotten lost? Have you ever been headed in the wrong direction? 
I can remember the most lost I've ever been, and it was kind of frightening. I was uh, serving as an intern in Frankfort, Kentucky, with the Holly Hill Church of Christ, and we did a vacation Bible school with the Owingsville Church, and we were staying in the home of one of the one of the church members. They lived way off the beaten path. They had a driveway that was probably a half mile long, and I was not familiar with the area. And somehow or another, in returning to their home in the evening, it was dark, we got lost. I don't know if you know much about that area, but there's not a whole lot there. Just a lot of country roads. I had two or three teenagers in the car. They were not my teenagers. And we had no idea where we were. And it almost looked like we were going to have to sleep in the car and just wait till it was daylight. And then we just happened to find the road that we were looking for. But that's the gospel. We get lost, and we don't know where to go. And God in Jesus Christ gives us an opportunity to turn around. Believing in Jesus Christ, believing that He came and lived according to God's promise and died according to God's will and came up out of that grave on the third day, we have the opportunity to follow His example. That's what this psalm is about, following the example of God, walking in God's way, to be, to be made new just like Kaylee was on Wednesday night, a child of God after we're immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. The psalmist first says, if we're going to follow God's word, we've got to follow with our feet. We've got to walk in the pathway of the Lord. We've got to follow the example of the Lord. He then moves on in verses 10 and 11 to discuss the heart. He talks about seeking and storing the word of the Lord with his heart. Now, the psalmist is not preaching. He's not saying, you seek, you store. He's saying, this is what I'm doing in order to obey God's word, in order to put God's word to use in my life. And now we've got to understand the meaning of heart in the Hebrew text. And I'm by no means a Hebrew scholar, but my best understanding of it is, is is something of a combination of the understanding, the will and the affections. That is what is meant by heart here in this verse. It is not a reference to the organ that pumps blood. There is a different word that is used for that. And so the psalmist says, I seek the Lord with my heart, with my understanding, with my affections, and with my will. In 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, God is preparing to anoint David as the coming king and replacing Saul. And he says, I'm seeking a man after my own heart. That is one whose purpose aligns with my purpose. Saul had turned his back on God and gone his own way. He was pursuing his own purposes. And so God says, I'm looking for a man who will pursue my purpose, who will follow my will, who will share my affections. And that's what the psalmist means here when he talks about seeking the Lord with one's heart. To use the inward person as opposed to the outer person to follow after God, and then he says that person is to store the Word in his heart. Now, that certainly carries with it the idea of memorization. I think it's a great pity, and I don't mean to be condescending, I I, I struggle with it myself, that we have lost this as a society and as a church. There was a time when it seemed that if a person was a member of the church, they could quote scriptures. You don't see that as much anymore. Now, there's a couple of things there, because it's not just about the ability. It's not to quote them and say, oh, look at me. I've got half the Bible memorized. I can say all of these things from memory. It's not really about that. It's about falling in love with the Word of God, so that you can't help but commit it to memory. You can't help but allow it to infuse your being and be a part of your everyday life. There's a story told about Nikita Khrushchev. He was the premier of the Soviet Union from 1958 to 1964. And in and, and doing some research for this sermon, you know, I, I wasn't alive when he was in charge there. Uh, and he died when I was still very young. But Khrushchev has a sort of debated history. There are those who say, well, he really was a great step up. He was one of the better leaders in that area of the world in the last century or so. And then there are others who say, well, he was one of Stalin's right-hand men. He was one of the few 
who remained in Stalin's inner circle and didn't end up getting assassinated by Stalin. He was the one who was responsible for the building of the Berlin Wall. He was the one who was responsible for the Cuban Missile Crisis from their side. And so his, his place in history is a little bit debated. But there's no question that he was a communist and an atheist. But Khrushchev grew up in a, in a small village in the Soviet Union, whatever it was called when he was a child, and he attended the village church. And he memorized scriptures in the village church because, it is said, he got candy for every verse that he quoted in the assembly. I didn't promise these children candy, I'm sorry. And then, as he got a little bit older, he was invited to attend the church school, the church's private school. And he chose to do that because he learned that he wouldn't have to work in the fields for his family if he attended the church school. And while he was there, he memorized all four of the gospel accounts. But by the time he was an adult and the premier, the leader in the Soviet Union, he was an atheist. And he was able to quote at length from the Bible, but he had not hidden God's word in his heart. And it's evident in the decisions that he made and the way that he led for whatever good he may have done, he was complicit in quite a bit of evil as well. The psalmist here says, hide, I hide your word, I store your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. In my mind, my affections, and my will, the word of God is my guide. He then moves to the mouth in verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 is simply a declaration of praise. He says, blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. And then in verse 13, with my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. Uh, there are two things we need to understand here. As the psalmist does throughout the entirety of Psalm 119, he uses a number of different words that refer to the Word of God as he had it, which would have been portions of the Old Testament at that time. And some of those words refer to God's promises. We're going to see one of those words later in, in this section of the psalm. Some of those words refer to God's rules and his judgments, the, the history and the prophecy, all of these things. The Bible is a multifaceted document. And so he refers to the Bible in a number of different ways to show that. And so here he refers to statutes. And those are rules but within that is the idea of something being owed. In other words, God is worthy. In declaring these things, He is worthy of obedience. And then He uses the word rules. And I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible has a footnote that says, just decrees. This word is directly related to the word for justice in the Old Testament. And so when you obey His rules, you are keeping justice alive in the world, if you will. And so the psalmist says, first of all, I praise the Lord with my lips, with my mouth. We did that together this morning. If we're singing with our hearts as we praise the Lord with our mouth, we're glorifying God. We do that even when we pray. We thank God and we praise God as our Heavenly Father who is good and who loves us and who sent His Son to die for us. But do we do that in our everyday conversation. When I was growing up, I had this fear almost that I couldn't say the name of God because if, if I said it, I was using His name in vain. But it's not in vain in our daily conversation to say, thank you, God. That, that's a very simple and short prayer, but it can be very meaningful when we say it and we're unashamed of saying it. We're, un, we're unafraid to say in our daily conversation with others, God is good. Let God be praised. When I had my accident a few weeks ago, I was talking to a mechanic and I said, I'm here by the grace of God. I don't claim to know what God is doing, but I believe He protected me in that case. Do we incorporate God into our daily conversations? Not to show off, but because He's on our mind. Because His Word is in our mouth. That's what the psalmist describes here in verses 12 and 13. James says in James chapter 3 and verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My beloved brothers, this ought not to be so. There's a lot of good that we can do with our words. Words are powerful. We have to make the conscious decision every day that we're going to use our words 
for the power of good, to proclaim the goodness of God, to talk about what a wonderful God we serve, and to praise Him, and to quote Scripture where it is appropriate. And so the psalmist says, how does a young man keep his way pure? He uses the Word of God to guide his feet. He uses the Word of God to guide his mouth. He uses the Word of God to guide his heart. He uses the Word of God to guide his eyes. He talks about delighting in the law of the Lord. Now this is not necessarily there in verse 14. Not necessarily a visual thing, but how can one delight, how can one gain joy from God's testimonies? Well, naturally, it is by reading them in our case. By reading the Word of God, we can gain joy from it. When we stop reading the Bible because we have to, or because we want to prop up what we already believe, and we start reading the Word of God because we love God and we want to hear Him, then we have understood verse 14. He says, I delight in your testimonies as much as in all riches. And then the last part of verse 15, he says, I fix my eyes on your ways. The New English translation says, I gaze on your behavior. The CEV says, I follow in your footsteps. The idea is through the Word of God we are watching God to imitate Him. That's what we were talking about in the Bible class this morning, Sid. We're watching God. How do we watch God? How do we know what God is doing and what He has done? By reading His Word. And so we set our eyes on God's example and we follow that example. We delight. Joyfully we follow in the footsteps of the Lord. Uh, recently, because of the upcoming Tokyo Olympics, there's a story that's been circulating about a Paralympian by the name of David Brown. He's, he's pictured there on the screen. He's got the, the blindfold over his eyes. David has been completely blind since he was about 13 years old. And he is a Paralympic runner. But he runs with a guide. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but he's actually tethered uh, to the man with the blue cap on. And uh, this is a very unique situation. They practice together. And the guide has to do a number of different things. He has to learn how to match David. Step for step, stride for stride. He has to account for David's speed. He has to account for David's height and his stride length. And he becomes David's eyes on the track. And so, after the starting gun, the guide is the one who says, accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. As they come around a curve, he's going to say, turn and lean. Or, or whatever the case may be, the guide is David's eyes. And here's the interesting thing about it. If David wins, the guide wins. Now, I wonder what it would be like if we focused on God's example as closely as David's guide has to focus on him in an Olympic race. That's a pretty powerful thought, isn't it? If we were watching God as closely as David's guide has to watch him. And the psalmist says, I set my eyes on you. I follow in your steps. I imitate you, God. A young person, an old person, and in between. We use the Word of God to follow His example. And then finally, we set our minds on the Word of God. He says, I will meditate on your precepts. I will not forget your Word. This idea of meditation is to think deeply about the Word of God. Uh, to... to Roll it around in our mind, if we will. Not so that we can take it apart and say why it's right or wrong, or, or so that we can affirm what we already believe, or we can figure out why what we've said is wrong. So that we can grow in our understanding of who God is and draw closer to Him as we know Him more and more through His Word. And then verse 16 says, I will not forget your Word. The Word, Word there could also be translated promise. 
when we understand what God has promised and we allow that to be with us in our minds, day after day it becomes a very strong motivator for us in the way that we live because we know what God has promised to those who are faithful. And so we allow God's Word to permeate our minds. So many different entities are vying for our attention. I can't stand advertisements. I don't like commercials on the radio. I don't like commercials on the television. I don't like billboards. So many different groups and individuals want our attention. And it's not just advertisers. The media companies, they want our attention. The movies and the television, they want our attention. And you know, I find it is all too easy to allow things into my mind that are not necessarily bad, but they aren't what's best. It's all too easy to occupy my mind with frivolous things. It's not wrong to watch television or read books that are appropriate, but if we allow those things to occupy the bulk of our attention and our time, we've missed it. And the psalmist says, I, I'm meditating on the Word of God. I'm not forgetting the Word of God. It's on the forefront of my mind. It's what I'm thinking about day in and day out. As Paul comes near to the end of his letter to the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What's on your mind? What are you thinking about? If we're thinking about the Word of God and the promises that He has made, then we're able to do what the psalmist says in chapter 119, verse 9. Guard our way according to the Word. Live out the Word that God has given. The psalm is not about falling in love with the Bible. The psalm is about falling in love with the God of the Bible who has revealed Himself in His Word. There's another word that I want to think about as we close. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Later on in the same chapter, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus revealed God to us. And as God, and as the Word of God, who revealed God to us, He lived a perfect life. And then He gave that life on the cross to pay the price for your sins and mine. But death could not hold Him as on the third day He rose and ascended to the Father where He is seated now at His right hand and He invites all people to believe in Him and to find new life in Him repenting, confessing, and being baptized come up and walk with God, to follow after the pathway of God, just like the psalmist says. If you want to answer that invitation this morning, do not hesitate to come as we stand and sing together.